when you turn 12, we will go scuba diving, is what my dad told me. And we did. And with every dive I took on these beautiful reefs around the world, I realized I wanted to become a marine biologist. These coral reefs fascinated me. So when it became time to choose a study, I decided I wanted to study marine biology. But when two universities from the US sent me their acceptance letters, I was battling with a breakup. And I didn't want to leave my family to go live in another country and study a job that would have no prospects here in Switzerland, which is landlocked. So I decided to go to ETH in Zurich and study environmental sciences. I didn't give up on my marine biology dream, though. Before going to ETH, I spent two months volunteering at a national park in the Caribbean. There, I got to dive and go on turtle patrols. And I learned that I really liked the simple life immersed in nature. A few years later, I went back to the same place and did a six-month internship as a, in the marine park. During that time, I realized, yes, marine biology was still the thing. But I also realized I missed my friends from ETH, and I actually decided to go back to ETH rather than going for a master's in marine biology. I only spent a year at ETH, though, to do the coursework. The other year I spent in Florida for my master thesis and my internship. After the year in Florida and after finishing my master's, I was set on becoming a marine biologist. It was my number one goal. And soon enough, I landed an internship and then a PhD. And for the first time in my life, I could say, I am a marine biologist. That was the best feeling in the world. I got to go on amazing adventures in my life due to my job. I got to go to Palmyra Atoll, a really remote and pristine nature reserve in the middle of the Pacific. A ticket to go there is almost as hard to get as going to space. As a tourist, it's almost impossible to ever set foot on this atoll. But as a researcher, I was able to spend several months there studying these incredible reefs. I also got to go, um, I also got to explore the deep sea in a submarine, going 200 meters below the ocean. But I also saw how our coral reefs were suffering. My very first dives in 1998 were on a completely bleached coral reef, which bleached during the first global coral reef bleaching event. My master thesis was on the human pressures on coral reefs that impact the reefs in Florida. And just recently, I had to witness a new coral disease coming to the reefs I was studying and teaching on every day, taking on corals left and right and killing them really fast, within weeks or months. Some of these corals I had a personal connection to, and it was very hard to see this and see them get infected. For a long time, I thought my job as a marine biologist was to do the kinds of studies that help the managers safeguard our reefs. I was convinced that our global leaders are doing everything they can to take care of cli climate change, and that my role as an individual was to lower my carbon footprint or ecological footprint. Lowering that footprint wasn't that easy to do for me, because my job involved a lot of travels. 
I was the eco-conscious person in my family, or the most eco-conscious person in my family, but I was also the person with the highest carbon footprint in many years. That didn't make any sense. But all the opportunities I got for advancing my careers generally ca came with a big carbon bill. So as I was striving for personal success, like my colleagues as well, we together were contributing to climate change, which kills our coral reefs. So in 2018 and 2019, things changed for me. First of all, it got clear that how we were dealing with climate change until now wasn't working. We weren't really getting anywhere. And because it wasn't working, and we haven't changed for so long how we were trying to do this, we now really had to hurry and find another way. 2018 to 2030 are the most important time in our human history. In this time, the next 10 years, we are deciding whether or not we're going to live on a planet that sustains life in abundance, or if we are continuing our path towards a planet where it's hard to live for many plants, animals, and maybe even us humans, where potentially our civilization will collapse. I'm really excited to be in Luzern tonight, because last year, Lucerne decided to declare a climate emergency. With this, the canton and the city showed that they take climate change as a serious problem that they want to tackle. I myself declared a sort of a climate emergency on a personal level in 2019. I was reading the book Be More Pirate by Sam Conniff Allende. And in the book, he asks the readers several questions which you are supposed to write your answer down to. One of the questions was, what principles, values, or ideals are you willing to fight for? And with fighting, he meant risking your job, risking your reputation, risk losing friends and relationships, like a real fight. Not boxing, but really standing up for it. For me, this was the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. Having that written down showed me that in my life or at the current life I was living, I wasn't doing enough for climate change. I wasn't speaking up, up enough, but I realized I could because the things that I could lose by doing so were not as important as the issue I was speaking up for. So I did. The book also inspired me for the role I was going to play in these next 10 important years. Because after all, when I'm going to tell my hero story to my grandchildren, I need to have a good character. And I decided that character is going to be a climate pirate. My first act of getting into good trouble, as we pirates call it, was changing the lecture I was giving in marine ecology. It was a lecture on climate change, and it looked like this. Lots of graphs showing how different animals are affected by climate change. It wasn't very engaging, it was one of my least favorite lectures anyways, and I'm sure my students didn't like it either. I got rid of all the graphs, and I put in this infographic, showing the difference 0.5 degrees of heating can make. At 1.5 degree, our, our coral reefs are hanging on a thread. At 2 degrees, we, we may lose most of them. So I asked my students, who would like to study coral reefs for their job? Lots of them raised their hand. So I said, OK, let's have a look. When are we going to hit 1.5 degrees with 
how we are working right now and the promises we have made. And I asked them, is this enough time for you to build your career? You have to finish your bachelor's, maybe start a master's, maybe even a PhD, and then what? This really hit home, and I had my first pirate crew. I mentored them to become climate activists and speak up about climate change, while also speaking up about it myself. But I realized another controversy. I was spending all my time teaching them how to do coral reef science, when if I really wanted to help them to become coral reef scientists, I had to spend most of my time fighting climate change. So I decided to do that. I put in my resignation letter last August, and since December I am on what I call a climate change sabbatical. I don't regret it at all. The first thing that happened after I announced my decision is I got an email from the president of the NGO called Fearless Fund. They are working on practical solutions for climate change, and I needed my expertise on a specific algae. I love the name, and of course I was in, and I volunteered with them for a few months this year. Also a few weeks after I resigned, um, another pirate started speaking up from the faraway islands of Hawaii. She didn't want to fly all the way to um, Germany for a conference, which was, was a week long on coral reefs. Flying there and speaking about coral reefs there would actually harm our coral reefs the ones we wanted to save with this conference. So she wanted to attend it remotely from Hawaii, together with some other colleagues who could also not justify flying across half the globe for something like this. But the problem was there was no option to do so. I agreed with her, and so did another colleague, and together we or organized and made an al alternative. We made the option to have this conference in Hawaii and the Caribbean. So this summer, we hosted the first virtual coral reef conference, a global conference called Global Coral Reef Week. We had over 150 speakers and 2,700 par participants. We made the impossible possible. Wait a minute. A virtual conference is not impossible. There's like a hundred, a thousand conferences that went virtual this year due to COVID-19. Yes, it wasn't a very hard task. We were complete novices and the three of us managed just fine. But the impossible part was that people were asking for this for 20 years. And we were the first ones who stood up and did it. So getting somebody to do it was the impossible part. And it's the same with decarbonizing our lifestyles and our economy and regreening our planet. It's not impossible. We got the technology and we got the money to do this. The impossible part is to have people actually start and do it. That's why we need ordinary people like you and me to step up and get to work. Question the status quo. Speak up. Speak up loud and speak up often. Think outside of the box and be creative. Create those alternatives that we are lacking. Lots of pirates have created alternatives in the past. And some of them were so successful that they became the new status quo. A climate emergency shouldn't be um, an empty promise. It should be a sign to say, this problem is really serious, and we want to work on it. We want to work on it together, everybody in this society. 
So if you live somewhere where there is a climate emergency, or like me, you said personally, you think this is a climate emergency, I ask you to join our team, join the movement, join the crew. We are going to write history, and you want to be on the right side of history for this one, because it's going to be very exciting. You got nothing to lose by doing this, and a livable planet to gain. Thank you. <laughs>